I am here with a member of Black Girl Hockey Club, Tanisha Singleton. How are you today, Tanisha? Very good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. And I am so excited to talk with you, first of all, because Black Girl Hockey Club is gaining a lot of followers. And just the topic alone of Black girls playing and rejoicing in hockey is so intriguing. So yeah. please talk to us first about Black Girl Hockey Club. Yeah, it, it struck me as intriguing as well because I originally first discovered the company or the organization. Uh, it had to be the summer of 2019, you know, when we were allowed to go outside. And I saw on Twitter, just kind of scrolling through, just randomly, I just saw like at Black Girl Hockey Club and I was like, huh? Like, hold up, what? It was just so, just that name, that handle alone. I was like, can't go on, right? So I like click it, look into it a little bit. And then I realized it's an entire community of black women across the world who play hockey, love hockey and a community that is really a for us, by us kind of thing. And those that are our allies and have recognized that the culture of hockey has been associated with a very toxic narrative in the past, one that has not been traditionally welcoming on or off the ice, right? And so after I saw that headline or in the, the account, um, I recognized that Renee, the founder and executive director of the organization was putting together a meet and greet in LA, which is where I was living at the time for a Kings game when the Golden Knights were in town. So I was like, okay, I have to see this for myself. Like, there's no way this is actually a thing, right? So I get tickets, I, you know, sign the member release or the media release form, all that stuff. And so she wanted us to show up if, like in the morning, like 10 a.m., you know, tailgate, do your meet and greet, that kind of stuff. And I show up 10 a.m. at outside of LA Live, where, you know, the Staples Center is. And I already see about 50 people deep of black, white, Latino, gay, straight, men, women, handicapped, veteran, short, but tall, like the most diverse array of people I have ever seen in my life, let alone at a hockey event, right? Like at a park, I would be struck like, wow, this is beautiful. But seeing them all wearing Black Girl Hockey Club swag, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so damn beautiful. This is so damn awesome. I need to be affiliated with this. So that was my first time meeting Renee. Uh, a lot of the other members, Blake Bolden. Um, and from then on, um, I kept in touch with Renee and was like, I need to work with you guys in some capacity. I would love to help um, be a part of this organization and bring awareness to it um, and contribute. So I'm now on the board of directors, which I'm very excited about and being a member there to really help with some of the programming, logistics, events, um, other events, the scholarships, leadership, all these types of things. So, and then, you know, obviously the pandemic happened in 2020. And so us shifting from these trad traditional meet and greets in person to more online events. Um, but it's really, we've gained extra momentum because of, of the unfortunate events that have been going on in society when it comes to race. And using sports as a prompt to have these larger and very important conversations is something that we really embody. And so in doing so, we've created the Get Uncomfortable campaign, and that is to disrupt racism on and off the ice and by creating awareness of these types of things, what being anti-racist is as opposed to just being, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. So, because the organization, you know, Renee started it um, around 2018, just F out of sheer, she was traveling and she just happened to be in Dallas and went on Twitter and was like, any other black girls want to watch a hockey game? <laughs> and after that, just seeing the, you know, influx of people from all over the planet, you know, really like, oh, I'm in Philly. I want to watch. I come to Philly. Like, hey, anybody? Oh, oh my God. What about here in Winnipeg? What about in LA? Blah, blah, blah. And so it's just really snowballed and in, in, in the recognition that this is a community that typically has not been addressed, welcomed, or even spoken to in an authentic manner um, at all levels of hockey. And so this is one of those like, well, if nobody else is gonna do it, <laughs> we might as well you know, make sure that we are here to support ourselves and that our voices as fans, stakeholders and players and lovers of the sport are heard. Mm -hmm. 
and your introduction to Black Girl Hockey Club is really recent, but talk to us about your introduction to hockey in general. When did this love for hockey start for you? You know, I've just been a sports lover my entire life. So whatever has been on, I've tend to watch. Um, I grew up watching pro wrestling. I grew up watching boxing. I grew up watching just anything competitive. And I played damn near right, anything they let me play. So I played basketball and that's my first love. And with that season being at the same time as the NHL, I always had priorities for me just because like, okay, well, I have to watch the NBA. But anytime the playoffs happen, the Stanley Cup finals, then I would always make sure I was able to catch the hockey game because the playoffs is just there's nothing like, um, you know, it's just so, there's nothing like it. Um, so, but I remember very early on watching hockey and, you know, the Mighty Ducks and all that stuff. And I was a kid at the time and I grew up <laughs> in Riverside, very close to the pond or the Honda Center, whatever they call it now. It's always the pond to me still. <laughs> um, and going to games there as a kid, I think I went a couple of times, like as a field trip for school when I was living in that neighborhood and just always getting kind of oogled at and eyed at. And it was just always felt weird. Even in college, um, I remember I went to UC Santa Cruz. So we saw a lot of Sharks games up there because close to San Jose. And even then it's like, what are you guys watching hockey for? You don't need to watch hockey, blah, blah, blah. Like comments from other people, my age, older, younger, it didn't matter. There was always just that converse, that narrative of we don't watch hockey. We don't understand hockey. We shouldn't. And it's like, that's the most ignorant stuff I've ever heard, right? And even bartending in LA um, for a dozen years, I would put a game on and, you know, a, a lot of the patrons would be like, what are you doing putting that hockey stuff on? You know, it was like, change it, put it on NBA or whatever. They just assumed like my black eyes watching hockey was weird. And so uh, doing the most to eradicate that stigma is something that we're really trying to, to work on as well, because we know there's just, there's a lot to that. And that isn't a flip of a switch. That stuff is generational and representation matters. And that's on the ice and off the ice. So if more black women watch hockey, go to hockey, support hockey, and our color commentators, are the journalists, are the photographers, are the media, are the coaches, are the refs at everything, then it will become more awkward to say, what are you doing watching that than it is actually participating. You know what I mean? So let alone from you know a player standpoint, but I grew up watching literally everything, like I said, and I now live in Las Vegas, so I'm a Golden Knights fan. I just had to I'm like, okay, <laughs> so I put, I'm all in now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, some, it's definitely something that I've recognized now there, we're everywhere. There's so many young black girls that love hockey and love watching it. And I've been so blessed to see that because of our scholarship program and being able to see all the applications, meet and speak with the kids and parents of our awardees and their eyes light up. They love this. And they recognize at an early age that color matters and that I'm the only one that looks like me playing this. And hearing those other stories that are very, very emotional and, and similar to that of what Soroya Tinka recently wrote in the Players' Tribune, um, that stuff's real. So it's, it's definitely, you know, part of our, and at least my, um, something that I keep very conscious and forefront in my mind at any time that I'm trying to help implement new initiatives and programs and events for Black Girl Hockey Club, because we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable not only being a fan, but feeling like they're qualified, valid, and welcome at any level in any position in any role in and around hockey. Mm -hmm. And expanding on those initiatives and programs that Black Girl Hockey Club is trying to do, especially going further into 2021 and being socially distanced, what are you guys up to right now, particularly in helping to engage younger players or inspired players, would-be players, uh, that would like to get out on the ice? Mm -hmm. You know, it's besides our scholarship program, which we give away three, uh, three times a year. So I believe it's like fall, winter and spring. Um, but one of the things, those are from nine to 18 year olds. And those are to help offset some of the costs because we know this is one of the most expensive sports to play. Um, and that being, you know, obviously a very real obstacle and hurdle that 
prohibit some pe families from even you know being able to allow their kid to play but we're also launching a leadership development program which i'm going to be the chair of and that is to really also establish mentors and get mentorships and linking students um, to different mentors at various roles and levels in hockey so even if you can't skate like me, <laughs> but you like broadcasting or you like your photographer or your journalist. We will associate you and link you up with someone who is established in the field so that you have a mentor and someone to look up to to help strengthen your own personal and professional development, right? And this will be, you know, for youth as well. And aside from just being on the ice. So and if you're you know, more interested in the on ice aspects, we have extra coaches, we have extra mentors, we have other conditioning wellness, which is also very, very important because we know being stymied and inside for this long um, until we know it's safe again to go back outside, we wanna make sure that everyone is really taking care of themselves first and foremost. So we've established um, a few different programs for just general self care, general wellness. You know, for in February, Black History Month, of course, we were bombarded with everyone's was like, hey, 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 just like as many, you know, Black thought leaders are in whatever role. Um, but we didn't do a lot for others in that month because we wanted to be here for ourselves. So what we did was every Sunday of February, we had a self-care Sunday where we had different things just for our community and our allies and our friends and families, you know, where we we had a mixology session where, you know, we were learning how to light drinks on fire, <laughs> you know, and then we had um, like a Galentine's kind of thing, you know, for Valentine's that Sunday. And um, did, we had like a DJ and then we had like a, a watch party session, just things that just to lighten it up and also just to be able to, to speak and share to ourselves. Cause we understand that wellness is very, very important. And especially for athletes, families, friends at all levels. So there's a variety of those types of things that we're implementing and continuing to do forward for the rest of this year until we know we can get back out and start to merge some of these in-person meetups, tailgates with those that um, are going to be more virtual or mixed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And you mentioned at the top of the interview, uh, Blake Bolden's name. Um, what is her relationship with Black Girl Hockey Club? giant supporter, giant advocate, giant leader, and will, is one of our mentors that we are linking up with some of our, the, our scholarship awardees from uh, the winter. So she's definitely very much engaged with us in helping me in the leadership development part. Um, we'll also be able to help with if the student or you know a, an, a, a youth wants to learn a particular aspect of the game, she's going to be able to be a resource for us to be able to find someone to link them up, um, so that we can make sure that we have a database of and a rolodex of people and experts and thought leaders in various spaces, so that we can make sure that our that our, our youth, those that are applying for these you know types of positions, will have someone in direct relationship with them. But she, she is our, you know, she's been one of our number one allies and supporters from the beginning. I think, I think Renee met with her randomly at like a Comic-Con in San Diego years ago, right when she was getting ready to start this and was like, you know, I'm thinking about a Black Girl Hockey Club. And, and Blake was like, do it. Yes, please. Now, why wasn't this a thing for me? You know, <laughs> so because it's, it's really that, that type of need, you know, and with hockey still being relatively niche to you know, NFL, NBA, MLB, I liken this vertical to that of like combat sports, pro wrestling, MMA, where there is not a lot of representation. And I can see, I mean, every time I, I tell this to my friends uh, that know that I like watching everything, they're like, oh my God, are you starting a black girl wrestling club now? Oh my God, are you going to start a black girl UFC club now? Like, <laughs> Like all those things just come up because we recognize, hey, you're making a community for yourself out of something that ordinarily wasn't intended for you. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's huge, right? When you see that there's a market that wasn't addressing you, wasn't targeted for you, but we've still been able to make elbow room for ourselves because we simply just want to enjoy it. That's huge. And that's what this, that's what Black Girl Hockey Club really is. And it's about, you know, making sure that we support each other, support ourselves and do what we can to plant seeds so that this can grow and be sustained 
sustainable. We don't want this to be a what this isn't a one off. You know what I mean? Like we're we here. We have been here. And those my age and older and you know, like even like Blake Bolden, where it's like, hey, I wish this existed then when I was playing. And we just know how appreciative um, the parents tell us that all the time when they're like, hey, we're I'm the only one to tell my daughter, hey, I'm so proud of you. But you guys saying that is is important and it echoes what you know some kids in neighborhoods that just aren't don't have a big um population of people of color it's the the one and only sometimes it's it's daunting and you don't know how to man you don't know how to deal with that sometimes mm -hmm. um so this is definitely that safe space where we're just trying to be as supportive and aware and innovative in terms of creating resources and programs for things where we see a need and it's not being addressed by anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I just want to throw out there, I'm a huge pro wrestling fan as well. Which yes. As well as MMA. So I'm really happy you brought that up because exactly we're here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> I'm super happy you brought that up because you did allude to the fact that there are similarities between uh, hockey and pro wrestling in terms of uh, engagement with uh, black and brown people. And based on your experiences, did you find that you were more accepted in the wrestling community versus the hockey community or vice versa or both on the same plane? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And I think I've honestly gotten more raised eyebrows about hockey than pro wrestling, hmm. honestly. And I think as I, the first live events I went to, I was, you know, five, six, seven years old. And I went to the Orange Pavilion in San Bernardino, California and was watching, you know, Coco Beware and, you know, Dusty Rose and to Shawn Michaels and the Attitude Era and DX. And I mean, I've been to like seven WrestleManias and every, even as a kid to now in my mid thirties, still going and watching wrestling, or even when I wear wrestling memorabilia, uh, I don't get anything except you know it's fake right and i'm like ah, yeah you, you're wearing a spider-man shirt do you know that's fake so miss me like with that you know uh it's like yeah no you know i was gonna cuss but i didn't know if i could <laughs> but but i honestly I, I think that was much more accepting or i didn't get as much weird vibes from that from being a wrestling fan every time if i go somewhere and i put on wrestling nobody really says anything they're just like okay who's that explain this to me if i put on hockey right now more more likely than not i would get a why are you watching hockey black people don't watch hockey and i get this from men black men in their 50s 60s my parents to this day they still like oh you still doing that black girl hockey stuff they watching yet what's the deal blah 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 <laughs> it's like yes mom but she was born in the 40s you know from in Selma, Alabama, she's 75 years old. Today is my dad's 75th birthday and they haven't seen anyone play hockey or see people like us play hockey or, or be in a hockey commercial. So I understand why they think it's weird. So we're just trying to correct that and hopefully you know, teach everyone in the generations in between, you know, those born in the 40s to present and in the future that this is cool and it is fine and we can watch hockey and we can change this. And it's all about trying to change the narrative, you know, that and change it from that toxicity, you know, and bro culture and stuff that is, that is just has always been so marginalized and discriminatory. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really changing that because I think if you got every hockey stakeholder in a room and I walked in and asked, okay, do you think hockey is perfect right now as it is? If the answer was yes, I would just leave because then there's nothing I could do about that, right? But if someone said, you know what? Yeah, it could be better. I'm like, okay, great, how? I would sit down and that we can have a dialogue because that shows then that there's at least a level of awareness that yes, everything can be improved and the things that need to happen, it's not a copy and paste solution. Like what, hap what needs to happen in Detroit is gonna be very different than that of Philly, than that of you know Winnipeg, than that of Vegas, so on and so forth. So it's about looking internally and doing that little brand audit for yourself in our communities and say, okay, what, do, what can we do here? What do we need to do here? Are there enough youth programs? Are there meetup parties that we can do? Are there enough resources? Like what, are, what can this community do to help bring more BIPOC black women and men and, and children involved in the game? 
at every level. Internships, sports, journalism, majors, and undergrad, everywhere. Who are you applying? Who are you hiring? Who are you talking to? Who are you allowing in the door? So it's at all of these different levels that we're trying to help improve the game of hockey because I wish we could just talk about the stats. I wish we could just talk about the game and like predictions and stuff and just be talk about on the ice stuff. And that's what's fun. But unfortunately, we can't because a lot of us still get crap. And it's it would be selfish to not even allow athletes to be able to speak about things because they're people first, first and foremost. So what's going on outside, yes, give, let them use their platform to speak their mind about what's going on. So we can't be as, oh my God, shut up and skate. Oh my God, shut up and dribble. We can't, we can't think like that. Mm -hmm. And you did state also uh, for your first outing uh, with the organization that it wasn't just black women and girls that you saw that there were people of different ethnicities and races. Could you please talk to us more about that? Because I'm sure that there are people watching this who aren't black that might be yeah. very interested in coming out with you guys. Yeah, it's, it takes a village. This, it takes a sincere village. And it's one of those things that like, you remember after like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and I'm sure you you might have gotten this just like me. Like I got phone calls and text messages from people that I hadn't talked to in years, but they just wanted to check in, right? Which is great. I mean, I love that they're like, hey, I know it's like rough outside. I haven't heard, you know, we haven't talked in a while, but just checking in, how you doing? If you need to talk, whatever, fine, great, much appreciated. But it was so exhausting, right? Like during that time period, it was just very, very heavy. The protests, everything going on. It was a very dark and emotional time for all of us, especially black women, right? And men. And, but what it, but what we've realized is that this problem of racism and police brutality, at least here speaking, you know, nationally within the United States or North America period or the world, that this is a problem that we didn't start. So we can't expect black people to fix the problem that we did not create. And so that means like we have to educate and have like, now we have that burden too. Jesus Christ, you know, like it's awful. So we have to rely on our allies. We, we white people need to talk to themselves. Check yourself. If you see something, say something. Like this is a societal human nature issue from the entire human experience. And with Black Girl Hockey Club, everyone is about empowerment, inclusion, social justice, social change. We just also happen to be really big ass you know, hockey fans, right? So it's that level of, we have allies because this takes a village. We're, this is the human race, right? We're one. So we need to have everyone involved that wants to, that, that supports social justice, that imports empowerment and equality at all levels, accessibility, equality, inclusion. And so that, yeah, that looks like every complexion, that's every shape, that's every size. While our mission is for specifically making sure that black young women and men are supported and engaged in hockey, that means others are gonna have to get involved too, just out of the sheer numbers and because we all have to share this space. And so for, with us sharing this space, yes, that means we all will look different. We'll all be shaped different. We'll all come from different experiences, but it's when we're all together and everyone that's in our community and that we engage with and that we invite to our events digitally or in person, we all are under that umbrella of empowerment and inclusion. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you very much for sharing that. Have you guys being inclusive and having people of all different backgrounds come to your events, have you all converted anyone that had no inclination about hockey whatsoever, didn't know anything about stats, the players, the game, et cetera? Um, probably. <laughs> I think so, probably. I mean, my, my own fandom has increased because of this. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we all have varying levels, right? Like fandom period of any sport, you know, you have your high, medium and low and your diehard fanatics and the more casual. And I think we've been able to still just enjoy 
our community and, and watch parties and, and enjoying the hockey and our conversations together because even watching others in our group, it's funny, like in our group chats and on Slack and anytime we have, you know, meetups on Zoom or Twitch or whatever. And it's, it's funny because I'll see two like get really, really into it. And then it's just funny to watch. Cause then it's like, we're learning at the same time. It's like, oh, well, I remember back in 95, like, and then that kind of stuff. And it's just fun to, to even observe that. And, and that's fun for anyone at any level. So, and I think definitely I, for myself included, I can, I can count that there has been at least one whose fandom has increased based on affiliation with, with being in the club, which has been very, very fun. Mm -hmm. And being such a huge hockey, you know, fan and, and being a part of this club and this wonderful organization and what they stand for. I'm going to ask you this question. Um, if there was one pro hockey player that you would love to interview, who would that be? Ooh. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say just because of what happened in the last season, Ryan Reeves, and because I live in Las Vegas now. And it's because remember when the NBA shut down for a while because of the, um, the shooting in Milwaukee, and I believe it was the Milwaukee Bucks who did not take the court that game. And the Golden Knights, I believe, were playing in the, the, that was the playoff round against Colorado, I think. And they stopped as well. So they, that, it was one day, it was the NBA, like the Milwaukee Bucks game. And then like the next game, the next day was supposed to be like game two or three of like that series. And they didn't. And I remember living in Vegas, I turned on the TV and of course it was on Sports Center and National TV too, but they showed a press conference and they had the two teams up there and Ryan was in the center. And he just spoke so honestly. And I hadn't seen that from many hockey players of any color, right? And he was like, listen, I hate these dudes, <laughs> right? He's like, I'm gonna punch this guy in the mouth. Like in other words, right? He was like, we hate each other on the ice. That's cool. And I can't wait to, you know, to punch this guy. But right now it's not about the game. Right now it's about something else. Right now we're brothers. Right now we need to stand together and we need to take a stand against racism and against police brutality. And they, they spoke, he spoke, he led that conversation. He led that press conference. And I saw the local reporters there in Vegas asking him more questions that he took the lead. It was one of those situations where when you have, he's standing in front of a microphone and there's like 30 guys behind him, right? And by, didn't hesitate, didn't hesitate in a response was very, very quick. Even when they addressed somebody else, he was like, let me make sure I get, you know, <laughs> he was like, I want to, I got a response too. So it was just so passionate to see that. And I, so I would love to actually, if I had the opportunity, would love to speak with him because he just administered so much authenticity and passion. And as a, you know, fellow passionate person, I did about every, a lot of different things and a lot of different sports, which I know he is as well. And he's also a very big advocate and always is promoting um, you know, like uh, adoptions and pet rescue and, and things like that. And so, which I'm, you know, a big fan of and support of, of as well. You know, we just talked about our fur babies. So <laughs> I, I think like he would just be someone that I would enjoy breaking bread with um, and talking about a amalgamation of things from passion to, to, to sports and society and that whole intersection, because I know it's, he probably has a very, very unique and, and, and valid story that is worth, worth the attention and I would just sit there like yes tell me more <laughs> wow that's lovely so you have that side on the other side who would you love to step out on the ice with and learn some hockey moves from Ovi I would love that like all day like <laughs> like all day and because he it's just so weird like seeing like when you see size on skates, that's just weird. Like just seeing bigger, larger guys, like just flow that flawlessly. I it just, it's mind boggling to me. And I, I love watching that type of stuff in slow motion. I'm like, rewind that. Like, <laughs> and that's why I always love looking at um, stats and looking at new ways of uh, 
experiencing the game and getting more like biometrics and that type of stuff. Like Ovi's somebody that I would be like, I'm a horrible skater, but <laughs> I would try. I would actually like risk bruising my tailbone and breaking limbs if if it meant I could, you know, get some time on the ice next to Ovi. Nice, nice. And I did hear a mention earlier about the Mighty Ducks, which is <laughs> one of my favorite childhood movies. Same. Who didn't watch that? <laughs> exactly. And it's funny because that's such a quintessential hockey movie. And everyone, especially people that never played hockey, didn't know what hockey was about, could relate to the story. Exactly. You know, so I have to ask you, are you going to watch the reboot of the Mighty Ducks? You know, I'm going to feel obligated to because uh, it was, you know, the pond that it was born like when I was basically, mm -hmm. right? And I grew up not far outside of Anaheim. So I'm going to watch it. And it's going to be one of those that I'm not going to expect much <laughs> in terms of like, oh, this is going to be a, a cinematic motion picture experience. Blah. Like, I'm not going to expect all that. I'm sure it's meant for, you know, like our age group that grew up with the, you know, the early ones and almost like coming to America too, but on a whole nother level, right? right? Where it's like, this is meant for us. That's just, you know, a nice revisit and it's great to see old faces and revisit old storylines as opposed to like, ooh, I'm so interested in this, you know, inciting incidents and plot twists, like not so much, but I'll, I will probably watch it for sure. Just I'll do chores while it's on or something. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. So who is your favorite Mighty Ducks character out of all the three movies? Oh gosh. It's, you know, what was her, I'm trying, I'm, her real name, I, it's, it's one of those that it's been so damn long. Like, I don't think I've even seen any of them like since they came out. Marianne, what is her Marie, Marie, Marie. I think I know. Is it Marguerite? Is the first name Marguerite? Marguerite. Yes. She was yes. My yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, I was like, what? Is her name? Like Marianne. Mar I knew it was an air. I was like, what is it? She stuck out to me. I was like, oh, that's great. And like, she's a friend of a friend, and it's one of those that like, yeah. So she just always stood out. So she was great, and that's yeah. That probably she was the first name I thought of. The first face that came to my my mind when you ask that. So Marguerite, for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe she'll be a part of Black Girl Hockey Club. You guys can. Teach. I know. That would be great. That would be awesome. Great. That would be awesome. Especially when, if we can get back outside and get down there. Yeah. Yeah. That would be really cool. I'm rooting for that for you. I'm, I'm, I'm wishing that for you guys. So I want to end this conversation. This has been fabulous, uh, Tanisha. Thank you so much for taking time out to speak with me and to hip our wonderful viewership about Black Girl Hockey Club and all that you guys stand for. So my last question really is what's next for Black Girl Hockey Club uh, coming up this year? We're entering a warmer period. So we would love to know what you guys will be up to. For sure. It's, it's great because we actually reached our six month mark of the Get Uncomfortable campaign that we launched. And so we're about to, it'll be March 23rd is our six month mark. And just yesterday, we realized we broke 5,000 pledges. So 5,000 different people have taken our Get Uncomfortable pledge, which we are ecstatic about. So we're Shortly, um, by the end of the month, early April, we're going to be sending out an update with some of our um, some of our stats and some of the notable takeaways of the campaign thus far, um, and which include like the three major pillars that I think I briefly mentioned earlier that we're really trying to stand for and what the GUC campaign intends to specifically, which is to employ, educate, and encourage. And with those three cam with those three initiatives really helping try to create some dialogue about how to make hockey better and disrupt racism specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, we're gonna be sending out some updates soon just about that, listing resources, help for people to get involved, how to get involved, creating more leadership development programs like we mentioned that Blake is, um, has been integral in helping us develop right now. We're officially gonna be launching that in the summer. So that's going to be something really, really great. And so we're going to be sending out a lot of new material and press release with information on how to get involved there in case you have want to nominate someone to be a mentee um, or apply yourself. Um, that stuff's going to be coming. We're also going to be launching a whole new set of programs 
and digitally for now until again we know and things are safe and open back up um that inc we've already started a book club which has been fantastic so that we can just educate ourselves and start to create conversations and then just taking some release off you know so in addition to that we've been doing a lot of digital events for minor and pro leagues and teams and clubs really about how to have these conversations when it comes to DEI, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But we're hopefully, we're gonna be having a, um, what's the word, a fundraiser and an auction. Um, that's gonna be coming up in the summer, probably May or June, where a lot of nice, beautiful items, custom items, we're going to be, yes, auctioning off where all the proceeds will go to our scholarship programs, and leadership development programs. So. Can't say what some of them are, but I'll let you know, they are some really, really limited edition, beautiful items that so many generous clubs, franchises, brands, and other organizations have donated to us to auction off, um, players as well. And yeah, and then hopefully we we'll, might also have some new merchandise coming up by the fall and by next, next season. So there's a lot to look forward to. And so just to make sure that nobody is missing out on anything, make sure they sign up on our newsletter and you can access it by going to blackgirlhockey.org and following us on social media, Twitter and Instagram and taking the pledge, take that get uncomfortable pledge because I'm helping draft all of our communications to update folks on what they can do to help disrupt racism on and off the ice and make sure that we are changing hockey's future to make it more inclusive and welcoming for everyone so that this is sustainable. That's what this is about and making sure that we can make sure our kids in the future can just enjoy the game without having to worry, unfortunately, about some of the other negative things that happen as a result. So lots of stuff to look forward to. And that, yeah, we're, re we're really, really excited. This is fun. That sounds amazing. And I myself am encouraged to join Black Girl Hockey Club just having this discussion with you. Uh -huh. And thank you to Black Girl Hockey Club for encouraging us to getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. 